Okay, welcome to the Transform the Assessment webinar series. Uh, today's session is on adaptive comparative judgment and the presenter today is uh, Professor Richard Kimball from Goldsmith College, University of London. So Richard, would you like to begin please? Thank you very much, Matthew. Uh, well, good, good morning everybody. It's good morning from England at least. Um, and uh, I'm going to be describing a process of uh, adaptive comparative judgment that we developed through a research and development project over a number of years in London. Goldsmiths is a, an unusual university institution. It's very big on performance disciplines, uh, music and drama and art and media and design. And I'm from a design background. Uh, we also have a strong education department. And uh, so as far as the uh, this piece of work is concerned, it, it originates in the design department and specifically in my uh, research unit, the Technology Education Research Unit, uh, and it's Project Escape, <coughs> which uh, was a collaboration between my research unit where um, basically our, our unit was interested in the relationship between technologies <coughs> and the assessment of performance because performance disciplines are notoriously difficult to assess and we did it in association with Digital Assess which is an evidence-based assessment supplier. <coughs> the project was commissioned by the Qualifications and Curriculum Development Agency who were at that point responsible for managing the curriculum in Great Britain and also by Bechter, who were responsible for putting information systems into schools. Uh, and we did it in association with uh, a number of uh, examination authorities, Cambridge and NXL and OCR in particular. Uh, the project stemmed from the difficulty of assessing performance disciplines and specifically design and technology because uh, QCA was interested to initiate the development of an innovative portfolio-based approach to assessing coursework at GCSE. GCSE, for those of you who are not from the UK, is the General Certificate of Secondary Education taken at age 16. Uh, QCA was interested in using digital technology to capture students' work and for grading purposes. Uh, phase one of the project started in 2004 and it went on for six years altogether and amounted to about a million pounds. <clears throat> so there are essentially two parts to this presentation. The first is about capturing the performance and then about assessing the performance. So first of all, uh, capturing classroom activity. We uh, a majority of the work was undertaken in the subject called design and technology uh, in the UK anyway uh, but we were also uh, looking at science the performance part of science you might say the science, science investigation where live investigations were being conducted in uh, science labs and we were also interested in geography field work where data collection went on remotely off-site. We arrived at these three disciplines for the focus of the work in discussion with exam boards and QCA. So going back to the design and technology studio, this is a scene from one of the biggest secondary schools in Britain. There's about 2,000 students in this school. Uh, this is one of their standard design studios but not standard in the sense that what you see circled in orange is my laptop and uh, the Wi-Fi system. So we created a local area network that operated within that classroom uh, and it sent information to and fro to handheld devices which you can see circled in yellow. So each student in the group had one. Um, and the purpose of these was to capture evidence of the process as we went along. This is typically a performance-based uh, portfolio 
uh, approach uh, to, to project work in design and technology. So students develop a portfolio. And the assessment of portfolios has become um, a bit of a nightmare. And when they move into e-portfolios, what that typically means is PowerPoint. And students spend as much time working on their PowerPoints as they do on their design project, which is both counterproductive and misleading. What we were trying to do was create a portfolio that was a real-time portfolio that emerged as the trace left behind from purposeful activity. So as the students were working on the task, we asked them, say, take a photograph or record a 30-second sound file. As soon as they'd finished it, it was whipped up into their personal web portfolio where their portfolio emerged automatically. Now, originally, we were using PDAs because that's all there was, uh, but we could record sound and text and drawings and photos. But now, of course, we're using iPads or similar technologies. Um, so the real-time performance evidence was captured through a six, this, in this case, it was a six-hour project over t undertaken over two days uh, with students doing audio reflections, making mind maps, uh, collecting data, particularly in the science investigations, they were collecting data on um, you know, recording times or speeds or whatever, uh, taking photographs of the work as it was undertaken, doing sketches, it was a screen sketching tool, um, or making video presentations, all of which was possible on that PDA. And as soon as the piece of work is, uh, if, if you imagine the, the six hour piece of work uh, interspersed data collection moments, so we might say, for example, after an hour, take a photo, whatever it is you're working, take a photograph of it. Uh, and then record a 30 second sound file about what you've done, uh, how you think it's going, and what you think you might do next, or how you might improve it, um, and so on. And then gradually what builds up, and this is examples of that happening through the design and technology portfolio, so that the, the information technology didn't dominate the system, it remained a design task so students were working with materials and tools. Um, they were reflecting on what they were doing, and they were sketching and showing. So it's a very design-like, authentic experience as far as the, the, the classroom uh, appeared. But what was happening was that in the background, a portfolio was emerging. Um, and if you imagine that as, as a kind of uh, timeline, so top left is the first box, then the second, third, fourth, up to the 25th box, which spans the six hours of the activity. Uh, and you should imagine that portfolio as a kind of set of thumbnails. The, the real data is stacked up behind this front screen. This front screen is just a kind of representation of the whole thing. Um, and you can see in box uh, six, there's, a, there's three little uh, pictures, photographs of a drawing, and then underneath it, there's those strange um, little uh, representations, and they are the sound files. So if you click on the picture, the picture comes full screen. If you click on the sound file, you hear the student talking to you. Uh, down on box 19 is the video. You click on the video button and the, the kid is there presenting work to you. So the whole thing is live and what you're seeing there is like the, the thumbnail version that, that is at the front. So that was the our concept of a portfolio which the students didn't have to work at. They didn't have to produce this like a PowerPoint presentation. It produced itself. All they had to do was do the work, um, which went into the uh, into the um, portfolio. So it's a real-time portfolio, not a second-hand reconstruction. It's the trace left behind by purposeful activity, using multiple response modes: text, photo, voice, video, drawing, in controlled conditions, in the sense that the teacher 
was controlling the points at which data was collected. We had ways of showing teamwork within it, all collected from mobile devices. Uh, that, that was important, that those small little handheld things meant that the technology didn't dominate the workspace. Uh, the, the workspace was a designing studio, um, unashamedly. And the handheld technology just enabled us to have the technology without the technology dominating the space. Uh, and the data was collected into portfolios that were completely secure. So that was the data capture bit. Obviously, there was quite a lot of work went into making all that system work. But uh, that was, as it were, the first part of the exercise. Uh, and at the end of that, we had, after a national trial, we had 350 uh, design and technology portfolios, uh, 60 science and 60 geography portfolios. And we began to consider the process of marking and judging. And the, it's important to recognize that there, uh, there had been a big big shift here in this, uh, in this piece of work because we got web portfolios. So kind of for the first time, we could have multiple judges from wherever they were looking at the same piece of work at the same time. And it enabled us to do a completely different kind of assessment. At this time in England, we were dominated by forms of assessment that uh, were highly addisc. So we had outcome statements in the national curriculum, and there were about 150 of those statements in design and technology, or extended marking rubrics from GCSE exam boards. And you'd have to say the reliability of these assessments was less than optimal. In 2014, 90,000 appeals were upheld uh, this is a review by the TES Times Education Supplement Insight Team. Uh, 90,000 appeals where a school said that cannot be right, the result here cannot be right, and they sent it back for remarking, and in 90,000 cases the appeal was upheld. Well, if those figures go on, and the, with, the, with the appeals happening more and more and more, by 2020, by the end of this Parliament in the UK, there'll be 1.4 million of these cases, which will not be upheld, but will be denied, costing schools about 166 million. There's got to be a better way of doing it than that. Because the real loser, the real loser in this situation, the real loser is not the children, and it's not, the, not even the school who's got to come up with all this money. The real loser is the curriculum because in 2008 uh, off quality body that regulates our awarding bodies warned that uh, the exam results of GCSE and the A-level were uh, inaccurate. In 2010 the minister banned coursework um, for in favour of the traditional end of year exam. Now there are all kinds of reasons for that but one of the dominant reasons for that was that the coursework could not reliably be assessed. So the real loser in this, with this poor assessment model, the real loser is the curriculum and specifically active project-centered pedagogy. So we started to look at different approaches altogether. You have probably all seen those images if you've had your eyes tested in the last 10 years, uh, and it's an image that is used by opticians, and they want to know how sharp the image is that you are seeing. But what they don't ask you to do is to say, look at the red one, and say, on a scale of 1 to 10, how sharp is that image? They don't ask you to do that, because it's almost impossible to answer. How sharp, well, how sharp is sharp? Uh, how, and I, I might give one answer. I might say, well, it's 6 out of 10 for sharpness. 
and it's a kind of arbitrary number that I'm trying to pluck out of the air. But if the optician says to me, which is sharper, the red or the green? I don't have to try and pluck a number out of the air. I can just look at them and I can say, actually, in this case, they're the same. But uh, in, if you were in an optician's setting, one of those would be sharper than the other. And by comparison, it's immediately obvious which is the sharper. This is uh, perhaps the most readily available, commonplace example of comparative judgment. Comparative judgment originates with Louis Thurston, who came up with the law of comparative judgment, who says when a marker compares two performances, his or her personal standard cancels out. To realize the, the importance of this, I want you to imagine two shopping bags. Um, the, two, the two shopping bags are placed on a table, and so I ask my mum to pick them up and she finds them both heavy. And then have, when I say which one's heavier, she'll tell me which one's heavier. But she finds them both heavy. Then um, Superman comes to the door and he picks them up. And he then says, well, they're both very light, but I ask him which is heavier and he will tell me which is heavier. The point is that my mom who struggles to lift either of them, can, will identify the same heavy one, and so will Superman identify the same heavy one. But if I ask them to say, how many kilograms in this one, or how many kilograms in that one, it's a much more difficult thing to do. Alistair Pott at Cambridge used this notion of comparative pairs for reliability studies between exam boards, in which uh, he was looking at uh, whether the standard of, for example, if you get a grade A in geography with one exam board, is it the same standard as a grade A in geography from another exam board? He was doing that within Cambridge, and I met up with him, and we uh, arrived at a way in which we could use, uh, and he was using comparative judgment as a kind of check on assessments that had already been carried out. But within the Eastgate, we've arrived at a way of doing it using comparative judgment for, for the frontline assessment. Essentially, teachers look at two portfolios on the screen and debate their strengths and weaknesses. So, the, you, you, first of all, you look at portfolio A, you work through what the student's done, and you see there the work, and then you look at portfolio B, and you work through it, and you do the same again. And at the end of that process, all you have to decide is which is the better piece of designing. That's it. That is the assessment process. Which is the stronger piece of work? Now, in that 2009 sample, we had 350 portfolios. Uh, and so you have to understand a round of judging. A round of judging is when each of those 350 portfolios has been paired with one other. That's round one. Um, and at the end of round one, all you can say is that half of them have won that round and the other half didn't. And that's all you can say. And then you go into round two, where it's compared to a second portfolio, at which point some have won twice, some have won once, and some haven't won at all. And then you go into round three. And after round three, some have won three times, some twice, some once, and some not at all. And then you go into round four and five and so on. And what you end up with is a rank. Uh, it's important to recognize that the, the 350 portfolios are sitting in one uh, space one web space, and all of our judges were dipping into and being given pairs to assess from that pot. So what emerged, what emerged from that, that rank is, that, is the collective professional consensus of all the judges. 
the don't be deceived by the A, B, C, D things. That's that's put on afterwards. That's a separate process. Just look at the rank. What emerged here from 28 judges, we did 17 rounds of judging and ended up with a reliability coefficient of 0.95. Uh, the 17 round of judging was necessary at that point in order to stabilize the rank, the, by which I mean we then do round 18 and what happens is the standard error goes down a bit because we've got more data but the rank order, but the rank order doesn't change. So once the rank order stops changing, basically the job's done. Pollitt reporting this process says the portfolios were measured with an uncertainty that's very small compared to the scale as a whole. The ratio is then converted into a traditional reliability statistic, a version of Convax Alpha, and the value was 0.95, which is very high in GCSE terms. He goes on. He compares it to verbal and mathematical reasoning tests that were developed for the 11 plus from the 20s up to the 70s. And these were designed to achieve very high reliability by minimizing intermarker variability and maximizing the homogeneity of the items that make them up. The KR20 statistics for those were always between 0.94 and 0.96. But the point here is that with Escape, in this design and technology task, a level of internal consistency comparable to those old reading tests has been achieved without reducing the test to a series of objective items. So why is it so reliable? Well, obviously, principally because it's using comparative judgment rather than absolute judgment. So the judge's personal standards cancel out. That's a big, big factor because teachers do hold different standards in their head and however much an exam board tries to neutralize that problem it remains a problem. It's also reliable because it's, it is collaborative and it brings uh, teachers together to share those standards. It's reliable because the algorithm is clever, the algorithm is selecting the pairs and, um, and it minimizes the number to be compared. So for example in 2009 we had to have 17 rounds of judging stabilize the rank. Well, as the algorithm has been refined more and more since then, it's now not necessary to go beyond 11 rounds to get that kind of uh, stabilizing. The other thing that's clever about the system is that difficulties that emerge in the judging process are made explicit. If you look at this uh, graph of the rank, you will see the blue dots which are where the system believes that each portfolio sits. And the tails, the up and down tails on that, those dots are standard error. And you can, so it's more like, it's, it's like saying the blue dot is the position plus or minus the tail. <coughs> and you can see that some of the tails are longer than others. And what that's showing you is that some portfolios are creating disagreement amongst the judging team. Some are saying this beats that, while others are saying that beats this. The, that's often the case in assessment. It's always the case in, in assessment. But what's happening here is that it's showing you where the, where the disagreement sits. And you don't have to wait to the end of the judging process to find it out because this data is in real time. It's live as the judges are conducting the assessment. So you can pull out those portfolios separately and treat them, treat them differently if you wish to. Moreover, the judges that are taking part in this process are developing their own profile. Um, we call it a misfit. Uh, so uh, a misfit statistic attaches to every judge and it's a measure of their consensuality with the team. Um, the team is the, the, the team judgment is the the result of all those coming together, and 
so we can see where the um, where individuals vary within that. In 2010, we submitted our pieces, our uh, report, Peascape Portfolio Assessment, to QCA, and they were responsible for. I, I understand there are some questions coming in. I I can't see this from the moment. I'll, I'll come to those questions in a bit. The Eastgate Portfolio Assessment was submitted to QCA in 2010. And it was at the same time that the QCA was dealing with writing SATs at age 11. Uh, and what happens with writing SATs is that children writing a short story, two sides of A4, something like that, and that was then taken and all marked by QCA and the results sent back to the schools and the schools reacted uh, very badly to those data and QCA was inundated with uh, a, a regrading appeals. And they asked us if it was possible to use the system for uh, use our ACJ system and so we adapted it to uh, take those text uh, pieces and we used 60 primary teachers to do those do the judging of those pieces of work and the reliability emerged from that was 0.961 which is more reliable than any other assessment of writing in the international literature but more to the point I think well that, that's significant but what's interesting is when the teachers were asked what they thought about the judging process. That many of them said we would prefer to do this than ordinary marking. And then they say, well, it allows for our professional judgment. It uses our experience. I'm able to make a better judgment in terms of the overall approach to text. And it cites me to think we could actually teach children the overall value of text. Has a positive and having a positive impact on teachers and schools. It's, it's not often you'll get that kind of comment emerging from teachers who have just come out of a big uh, assessment exercise. Comments about excitement for the classroom and the positive impact on the schools. In terms of how long judgments take, uh, obviously there's a variability and particularly at the beginning of the process. In round one, the, the yellow judge there is taking 20 minutes to make a judgment. And the pale blue one taking 15 minutes to make a judgment. And gradually this speeds up. And the median time in the design and technology sample was four minutes on, of all the judges over all the judgments they had to make. Uh, and that's speeded by a process that we call chaining. Uh, which uses the anchoring and adjustment heuristic that, so that instead of two portfolios, or after, after a, a round six, two portfolios appear, you make a decision, but then only one of them goes away to replace by one other. Uh, so you're only having to speed up, you're, you're only having to, as it were, get your head around one new portfolio in order to make the next paired judgment. Um, <clears throat> so we were interested in whether the speed of the judging had any impact on the reliability of the assessment. So without writing SAT, 60 primary teachers, the quickest was one and a half minutes and the slowest was 10. But there was absolutely no correlation between the length of time taken and the misfit statistic of the judges. So interestingly, what, uh, is, uh, what, what is explaining the difference in the time that's taken up? The, the work that we've done subsequently suggests that there are three elements to the judging process. One is a kind of surveying process in which the judges map out the, uh, the work. So they create a kind of mental map 
for what literally what has gone on. And alongside that, there is this characterizing process that fits that map to my previous experience of things that students have done, things that represent different levels of quality. And then as you're about to be making a judgment, there's a validating process that checks that the evidence that I'm fits the judgment that I kind of know I'm about to make. The evidence we believe for the difference of time it takes for judges to make a decision on this is that the, it's in the validating. Uh, that the surveying and the characterizing are about standard, but some judges require a lot more validating evidence than others before they are prepared to make that decision. So having undertaken all this with the judges and in the various disciplines, we, we started to explore what would happen if learners are invited into the same judging process. So what would happen if the students, this, this is uh, two 15 year olds who were part of the design and technology trial and we gave them the opportunity to review their work and their peers work. So what was interesting about that was that their reaction to it was why didn't you show us this before? Because I could have told my story better. So that having having seen all their the work that they had undertaken, having seen the work that their their peers had undertaken, obviously we couldn't have shown it them before because it didn't exist before. But given the opportunity to see this work, what happened is that they started to discuss quality. They started to say, well, this is a great piece of work, and that's not such a great piece of work. And when prompted to say why, they started to explore and clarify what, in their terms, they meant by quality. So the teachers who were part of the trial have said that it was one of the powerful things for them was encouraging the students to look, at, look in on the ACJ process. Uh, and and have these discussions about quality. We've done that more and more with uh, uh, groups of students in many different settings. So, for example, there's, uh, there's a link here to Brianna, who is the student president at Edinburgh University. The Edinburgh Award is a, an award that's available to all um, undergraduates at Edinburgh, and it's one of those awards that's to do with um, getting employment afterwards. So it enables you to, it, there's a whole set of modules that say, help you to prepare a CV or whatever else in, in, in terms of preparing for life after the university. So they draft a CV, and in this case they review it using an ACG review process. Uh, they look at their own work and they look at their peers' work and they say, oh, God, look, at, I could have done it this way. I could have done it that way. I could have done it that way. And it's a very instant and immediate comparison of one with another, which then enables the student to go back and rework it and finalize what they have done in the light of what they've seen others having done. So there is a link to Brianna here, um, which I believe I can click on. And you can hear it. Um, uh, Richard, how long is that video? Because if people want to click on the link, um, put it in the text chat also. People may want to go and watch it. It's about 1 minute 40 seconds. Okay, so if folks would like to click on there, we'll see you in about 1 minute and 40 seconds. <laughs> I'm not hearing it. Though. Can you 
Okay. So I just click that. Uh, Richard, you can probably continue now. Okay. Uh, uh, let me just... Uh okay. Uh, so, the, uh, the work that we've done since 2009-10, when the Eastgate project finished, has been various and in many countries. Um, everything from the Associated Board of uh, the Royal School of Music, um, English speaking, um, with Oxford University Press, in uh, the S Swedish Skolberg, which is a bit like um, our QCA used to be in England, uh, the Qualifications Authority. So a number of universities um, have adopted it within um, the same role as Edinburgh. Um, and the, the story continues. So really, what, what, I'm, what I've been trying to, ex to share with you is the idea of assessment in particularly in performance domains, where portfolios is the standard means for doing this, where the, first of all, it's about the creation of web portfolios and how they can be used to capture creative performance and how you can then move to reliable assessment uh, using comparative judgment, adaptive comparative judgment, and how the spin-off from that leads you into the, 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 the value of formative assessment, assessment for learning to improve students' performance. So if you're interested in any or all of that, uh, do by all means email me or Matt at Digital Assess, um, and I'll try to deal with some of the questions that emerged. Um, I'm not sure they're on my screen. They're on my colleague's screen. So I have uh, <coughs> Hi, Maggie. I see you put up your hand. Would you like to ask a question via your microphone? If you will, just press the talk button in the top left-hand corner. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Can you hear me? 
Okay, great. Um, just a logistical question. I'm wondering um, whether this process takes the same amount of time as a process where a one or two graders are grading a piece of work, or if it's at, yeah, what's the relative time burden for that in a practical thing? Thanks. Hi, Richard, did you get that question? Hello, Richard. I think we may have lost you. Can you just check that your microphone is plugged in because we've lost all sound coming from your machine? Hello. Hi, Richard. Yeah, you're back. I was wondering, did you get Maggie's question just now about the relative time this yeah. takes compared to normal? Yes, I, yes, I did get the, I did get that question. Um, and as I say, the, the studies we've done up to now show that the effect is broadly time neutral, but the time is used in a very different way. Uh, whereas, for example, uh, a teacher looking at a pile of portfolios in design and technology, they would have spent hours judging their own students' portfolios, uh, the, what happens now is that each judgment obviously t is much quicker, but what they're doing is judging a, a selection from across the whole national sample of um, portfolios, but they have to do a lot more comparisons. So we had 130 comparisons, and that took a chunk of time, which was broadly the same amount of time as they'd used before, but uh, but they were scanning across the whole sample. So there's an advantage in terms of seeing what the national standard really is, as opposed to just looking at the local standard within your school, but it was broadly neutral. But that was when we had to do 17 rounds of judging. We're now down to 10 or 11 rounds of judging in order to get the stabilized rank, and that is now making things significantly quicker. I don't know if that answers your question. Um, um, I see that there's, there's, there's a question here about norm referencing, uh, or there's a comment, should we say, from Tim Hunt saying this is norm referencing. But actually, it was initially, that's down to the training of the judges. Because the training of the judges says, yes, we are interested in certain qualities about the work. Uh, and we identified uh, four key qualities in a piece of work that says, yes, we're, we're interested in that quality, that quality, this quality, and the other quality. But don't try and score them for us. Don't give us a score for those qualities. Just hold those qualities in your mind. And then when you look at this piece of work and that piece of work, then make a judgment about which one is the stronger. So it's, 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 it's not criterion referenced in the sense that each criterion is scored. It's criterion referenced in the sense that each criteria, these baskets of criteria are held in mind as you make those judgments. Uh, I'm not quite sure uh, which of these a million questions to uh, adopt. Um, um, there's a question about how the grades get put onto the rank. The ACJ process, all it does is create a, a rank that says this is the this is the lowest piece of work and this is the highest best piece of work. Um, and if we went back through the some slides, we, we could um, get back to uh, a rank and say the good ones are on the right there and the poor ones are on the left. How do you put the rank? Well, that's a separate process, uh, as it is with awarding bodies in the, the present arrangement. They also produce a rank, but it's based on numbers. Uh, 
um, so awarding bodies that I've worked would typically find a way of putting uh, uh, the grades onto that rank by locating the position of the A grade, the C grade, and the E grade. The E is the like fail point, the A is like the outstanding point, and the C is in between. So they fix three points by looking at individual pieces of work and saying this meets the criteria for an A grade, this meets the criteria for a fail or an E. Um, and then having fixed those points, the rest are distributed uh, statistically. But it is a separate process and it's not part of the ACJ um, mechanism. It's something for the awarding body to do subsequently. Um, Yeah. Feedback, the feedback is important. One of the things you can do as a judge is leave feedback both of the on the portfolios and on the judging process. So as you're making your judgment, let's go back just um, as you're going through the portfolios, looking at those two, the judge can leave a comment about the portfolio and then leave a comment about the other portfolio and then when they make the judgment, they can leave a comment about the nature of the judgment. I Was it an obvious judgment, a simple judgment? Was it an absolutely clear judgment? Or was it a more difficult one? Because portfolio A was good for this and this, portfolio B was good for that, that, and that. But on balance, portfolio A was better than portfolio B. So all of that data can be collected as part of the judging process. So judge's reaction to it is both um, in terms of the way they feel about it, also in terms of the data we can collect about the judging process. How many comparative judgments required to achieve the ranking? Um, as I say, the, there's a question of how many comparative judgments are required to achieve ranking. Our current model, current, the current modelling, is that it takes 11, uh, 11 rounds, in which, um, which is not uh, so. It's not everything compared to everything. I mean, if we had with our 350 portfolios, uh, in Louis Thurston visualised all 350 would be compared one with another, and it becomes a logistically impossible process, which is why you need the software to imply judgments for you. Uh, <clears throat> so, for example, if portfolio A beats B, beats C, and beats D, the chances are that A will beat D even though they haven't been compared. And the software will come up with a, with a, with a number, a, a probability of one each portfolio beating each other portfolio. And that's, in the end, what the scores are in the, in the portfolio that make up the portfolio. It's the probability of this one beating another one. Uh, the number that we need to compare is currently is, is 11. 11 comparisons will give you this complete rank. But it depends on the process that you're trying to do. If all you're trying to do is share some judgments with a group of students, as in the case of Brianna, so that she's looking at half a dozen others or 10 other pieces of work so that she can get ideas about what she might do herself, then it's not critical how many others you look at. If you want uh, a stabilised rank, then you would need to go through 11 rounds. And the key thing there is how long it takes you to go through a round. And our experience has been four minutes uh, up to now. But would anyone know why each one's ranked is better, worse? 
astute and aware of the worst, right? What about the other? Those who found themselves well, there's a number of ethics. It's a very interesting question about the ethics of because because it does look like ranking, and um, and it does look like. Uh, and I find that there's this a lot. Teachers do have a, a, a natural preference not to, to rank students. But the, the ethical question for me is that what we have, the system we have at the moment for ranking, for, for marking portfolios, is that a teacher produces, a group of students produce a set of portfolios in my class, say. And the first point of reference for assessing them is me. And I make a set of judgments about those students. I produce a rank order. I produce a set of numbers. And I send them to the awarding body. And then the awarding body will say, well, I was a sample of them. And it's, and it's an absolute truism that standards in one school are different from standards in another school. That has always been the case, and always will continue to be the case, and everybody knows, and exam boards know it, and they try their best to neutralise those differences in standards. But it, it's arguably unethical that we have the situation that we do at the moment. What happens now with this ACJ system is that everyone goes into a common pool, and the real strength of that is not just that it's fair to the the, the students, it's because I'm not, the student is not being judged by somebody that knows them. That's one ethical question. The bigger question is that the teacher gets to see what the national standard is like, not what the standard is like just in their school, which is probably different to the standards in another school. If the teacher is, has a position in which they can see in front of them, work that's coming from a whole range of schools, they're in a much better position to make the judgment of a real national standard in relation to the children in their class. So I think, that's, uh, I think that outweighs any other consideration. There's a thing about tacit, there's a question here from Ed Russell about tacit knowledge. Uh, absolutely right, tacit knowledge uh, and criteria. Uh, there is a lot of um, teachers' expertise is very sophisticated um, and it does enable them and they, and they have a lot of tacit knowledge about what counts as good performance or less good performance. The problem that they have in an ordinary assessment is trying to put a number on it. If you come up with a quality like the sharpness of the, the red circle in the opticians, if you try to, try to put a number on that, it's going to be a very difficult thing to do. So, yeah, I think... I think I'm not sure it would be very helpful with these. So, a lot of questions coming in. Uh, the, the articles we are interested in about. Oh, just, uh, asked to complete marking at a particular time. Uh, that's an interesting one. Are judges asked to complete from Mickey Rushton? Are judges asked to complete marking at a particular time? Uh, what happens is that there is a window. So within a particular window, we'll do round one, and within another window, we'll do round two. When we did the original Eastgate um, assessments with 350 portfolios, um, it was the team was based in London, but we had judges in Australia, Israel, Ireland, uh, and Sweden. And we just gave people a window to say, within this, within this uh, period of whatever it was, please do a uh, round, round of judging. Um, so it's not that one person can complete all their judging before another person starts. It needs to be 
phased. Uh, it's, it's, easy, it's easy to know the pool blocking. Uh, it's easy to make judgments at the start of zero from clear distinctions. This is a, that's a very good question. What happens at the start of the round, at the start before you, you know, as you're undertaking round one, the, the software has no idea about the quality of each piece of work. They are like random pieces. So you might end up with a piece that is very poor and a piece that's very good. Um, and it's just a matter of coincidence and what, what, what pops up. So that has a simple judgment to make. Uh, the more the system learns about the portfolios, the more it can give you difficult uh, judgments to make. So it'll say these two portfolios are much closer together. Uh, the, the point about this is that there is an optimal difference between portfolios that makes the judgment efficient for um, statistical purposes. Uh, please don't ask me to explain it. It's based on logits, and I don't even know what logits are, but there's, it's, my understanding is that uh, it's something like the portfolios need to be 1.7 logits apart in all, which is close enough together to give you some very important data, but far enough apart to make the judgment easy to make. Um, and all that is built into the algorithm that drives the ACJ engine. So it's a good question to say, uh, they, they typically are easy to make at the beginning. Easy, judgments are easy to make typically at the beginning of the process than they are at the end. But the judgments need to be far enough apart so that the judgment can reasonably be made, and that can be controlled within the software. Hi, Richard. This is Matthew again. Um, Ed Russell has put up his hand to do an audio question. Would you like to take um, the microphone, Ed? You just press the talk button in the top left-hand corner. Yeah, sure. Thanks. I'll, I'll, post, I'll post it as well. Uh, thanks for a very interesting uh, presentation. Um, I've I'm planning to do a little uh, formative peer assessment exercise in a course I'm uh, teaching in July in, in China with group work. So the idea is that um, there'd be about eight groups, they'd all do presentations, and then I'd each get each group to, uh, to do the comparisons of about five other groups. Sorry, five comparisons of other groups. Um, and by my calculations, that would actually allow a complete set of uh, comparisons, so I wouldn't have to worry about the adaptive bit. Do you think that's feasible? Have you seen anyone do anything like that? We have, indeed. In your own, uh, you sound like you're from Australia. Uh, I am. Yes. We are. Uh, We've done some work, I don't know the detail of it, but I do know that it's done at the University in Adelaide in the teacher education program where students make video presentations of a little small piece of micro teaching. Um, then those have been used uh, using the ACJ uh, tools to share them with groups of students and get them to articulate what counted as a good piece of uh, teaching and learning. Okay. Uh, so I can send you the link to that piece of work. Uh, uh, and as I say, it's going on in the University of Adelaide. And it seems to be a perfectly, good, a perfectly viable and good way of putting it together. Thanks very much. Yeah. Um. 
Uh, Greg's just asked a question there. What does it take to access or use the um, uh, ACJ system? What does it? How do you get hold of the ACJ system? Uh, that is a, a question for my colleague Matt, but it it is. Sorry. Yeah, um, my colleague Matt uh, Winfield will be able to supply that information. Um, it'll be through digital assess. It's, it's basically a set of tools that you can download from the web. Uh, uh, so it's a simple process to get hold of the get hold of the tools. Um, the mechanism for for how it's how it's purchased is something that Matt would have to describe describe for you, and I'll make sure that that link is put up for everybody um, at the end of the program, at the end of this uh, recording. But it should be a simple down, download. I should say there are a number of tools uh, within the, the suite. There's one set of tools for uh, data capture, which uses those systems that I described at the beginning which is uh, enabling students to create portfolios very easily uh, without, in a way, without controlling the portfolio. The system just uploads their portfolios as the work is undertaken and the portfolio builds itself as a web portfolio. That's one element, of, that's one tool within the system. ACJ is another tool within the system. Um, so there are about four or five tools in the suite that are all linked together. Um, annotate is another of the tools. Annotate is, if you like, uh, the teacher's version that enables the teacher to go in to the student portfolios and leave comments and annotations on it. And those annotations can be as text notes or they can be sound files. So you could literally record a sound file onto the student's portfolio so that when the student opens up the portfolio next time, there's a teacher comment sitting there and they can hit the button and they hear the teacher talking to them about their portfolio. So all of that is in the, the A data capture, is the step one, and then annotation is, is an, uh, another tool. The adaptive comparative judgment is another tool, all within this same suite of uh, uh, tools offered by Digital Assess. Uh, is there a minimum population size? Uh, minimum population size, I mean that's an interesting, when we, when we first did a trial on this, uh, I have to say, when Collett and I were first discussing this back in 19, sorry, 2005 or 6, I was deeply sceptical that this could work, uh, that just by making those comparative judgments you could end up with the rank order. Um, so he said, well, send me, uh, send me, you know, 20, or give me 20 pieces of work. So I produced 20 pieces of work, this is paper-based work, we had portfolios of paper-based portfolios in front of us and I chose 20 of them um, and we had uh, the research team sitting around the table and he said, well, compare this one with that one, that one, that one, that one, that one. So we had, we spent about an hour uh, doing comparisons physically, moving bits of paper around the table to produce um, a rank and we, I had already got them on a rank based on a number based marking system and within about an hour of making all these judgments he sent me back the rank which was based on the, uh, the judgments that we'd made in about an hour and it was the same rank. Uh, and it was that that persuaded me that there was obviously something in this, that having struggled to assess these pieces based on numbers, we'd produced a rank, and he'd produced it much quicker with just 20 pieces of work 
and five people sitting around the room. So there, there is a relationship, there's a ratio between how many pieces of work you have to mark and how many judges you have to do the work. Um, and uh, that obviously, if you've got a lot of pieces of work, you'll need a lot of judges. But our experience has been, and we haven't got this down to a hard set of numbers, but our experience has been based on modeling classrooms. So where there's 25 children, there's a teacher. There's a general rule of thumb, at least in Great Britain. So uh, when we had the 350 portfolios that came in from all those schools, they were basically 25 from each school. And along with them came the teacher. And that ratio worked perfectly well. Uh, the judgments, uh, as I said before, the judgments had to be 17 rounds at that point. And it's still, the teachers were saying, actually, it's took taking us about the same time as it would have taken had we done the old system. But now it would be, take a lot less. So if you've got a small number of portfolios and a lot of judges, you'll do it in a flash. If you've got a huge number of portfolios and a small number of judges, it'll take you a long time. So Richard, thank you. I think we probably should draw it to a close here. Um, if people would like to ask questions further, I'm sure you're more than welcome to get in touch with Richard or Matt at Digital Assess. You can see their email addresses on the screen. They've also been pasted into the text chat. Um, all of this text chat and the links will be placed on their website so people may refer back to them later as well. So I'd just like to say thank you to Richard and Natalie and uh, Matt for your help in the webinar and particularly Richard for doing all the presentation work. Well, thank you very much, Matthew. It's very helpful and um, I hope it was interesting. Hmm. Okay, so I'm going to stop the recording, but if you would like to stick around, folks, you're more than welcome to do so. Um, so thank you once again and see you again in a month for our next webinar.